the middle. Okay. Yeah, Jarrell, you're here. Oh, wait, no, you're here. We're over here. And then TJ, you're there. TK is over there. Oh, my name's right there. So what? I've just given everybody's name. There, we're done. Go Shorts. home. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so we're going to kind of jump on in with introductions going down the line, starting with Ari. Um, gosh, let's see. My name's Ari, Ari Kartzog, and um, I am currently the stage manager and performance capture supervisor over at Funko Studios. Formerly Vanaheim. Correct. Right, formerly Vanaheim. Yep. We've just but um, let's see. I ended up getting accepted to USC's cinema school in 2015. And so when I was there getting my undergrad, I found out that they had a motion capture volume. And so while all of my friends were going, you know, I'm going to be the best director, I'm going to be the best, you know, cinematographer. I'm like, in Los Angeles, there's 20,000 people a stone's throw distance trying to do that. Hmm. Um, and going back to school so late in the game, when I got access to the motion capture stage, that's where I just went into overdrive because it's the perfect combination between performance and tech. And so uh, I, I pretty much lived at the Robert Zemeckis uh, <laughs> building for a couple of months while I was just pushing the system as, as much as I could. And what was different between me and most of my classmates is that the classmates were either generally in the animation program or the game design program, or if they were from the film program, they were more focused on how to integrate the data into their projects. Whereas my goal was to learn how to break the system, fix the system, get it up and down, and you know, be able to just do everything to manage a volume. Well, thank you yes. so much for being here. <laughs> Glad to be here. TK. Hello, I am TK Gorgonia. I am originally a voiceover, so... If you can't tell with that glorious <laughs> setup, if you can't hides. tell. Um, the Mufasa right now. Oh, <laughs> Simba, <laughs> remember. Um, but uh, yeah, originally I... I was a kines, I'm typical Filipinos. I was following uh, the medical route and whatnot, but I, I realized that I love video games way too much <laughs> to quote unquote get rid of that in my life. So I figured, oh, maybe I'll try things out. And of all things, I was at a Filipino restaurant and the owner came up to me and like, hey, do you do voiceover? I'm like, no. And he said, you should. So I did, I followed that and um, I did some audio books, uh, a couple uh, dubs here and there and fell into motion capture, and that was through um, the mocap vaults, which you will probably hear numerous times. There's people in our audience that are from the mocap vaults, uh, fellow students and peers, mm -hmm. and uh, basically I got to get a baptism by fire on the <laughs> performing side, which I fell in love with, and I figured if I'm not going to compete in video games professionally, if I'm not going to play them professionally and whatnot, I might as well be in the other end, and I've loved it. Cool. Yeah. Jarrell? Hello, um, I am Jarrell Hall. Um, I am an actor, geek, motion capture actor, um, stuntman, martial artist. I got into acting when I was really young. I was five years old when I got into acting and dance and things because my mom said, you have too much energy, so you need to do it, do something with it. Um, coming from a black and Filipino household, it's just really busy and really crazy and really loud, so I had to do things to basically entertain myself. Um, Fast forward to 30 something years later, I actually met a lot of these guys at the mocap vaults. I had previously knew about motion capture and I knew people in motion capture, but I had never done it myself. And same thing with him, baptism by fire, yep. jumped into mocap, realized that I love it more than doing stage or film because there's kind of a freedom to it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the cool thing about motion capture is you get to be kind of a five-year-old. Everything your parents <laughs> told you to oh, yeah. do, <laughs> you're actually getting paid to do, you know? Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> it was a lot of fun getting it, being able to jump, shoot guns, run around, spin, be crazy. And with my friends, you know, just having played this guy in games, having played Richard in games, and now I can call these guys colleagues and things and being able to do things with them. And even Ari is really cool. Um, oh, thanks. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Ari. Hi, my name is TJ Storm. Um, I'm an actor. Uh, I get to do awesome things with awesome people. It's the coolest thing. You guys are all here following your dreams. First, congratulations on that. Give yourselves a hand because yeah. that's brave. Yeah. True that. How many of you had to go off a path that your parents were like, you're going to what? How many of you guys had to do that? Just can oh, I man. get it? All right. So <laughs> I'm in yeah. class as a hands. kid. <laughs> exactly. I'm in class as a kid. and. I'd be making my friends crack up. So when the teacher turned around to write on the chalkboard, I'd be like, and I'd be going doing stupid stuff. And they'd turn around and they'd be like, 
what are you doing? I'm like, uh, 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 and they're like, you're not going to make a living doing that. You know that, right? And I'm like, well, <laughs> I was born in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I grew up in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, I was a super duper geek. I, I don't know if you guys know what Dungeons and Dragons is. I grew up playing it. I still play it. No, you can't be part of my game. It's full. But, but I, I loved geeking out. And I eventually, I was such a geek, though, that I was not an athlete. I was not cool. Being a geek back then was not cool, as it is today, apparently. But, but uh, in any case, I wanted to be cool. So I learned how to dance. I learned how to do this one move over and over again, and then a couple of other moves on top of that. And I, oddly enough, became quite good at it. I got better and better. I got a scholarship to go to dance school. And then I came out here and became a professional dancer. I worked on music videos and all kinds of stuff like that. Long story short, flash forward decades, and I'm still doing it. So now, uh, you may have seen some of my work. I was Godzilla in Godzilla. I was uh, Colossus in Deadpool. Uh, I worked on Avatar. I was the mech that he fights in, the, the hero mech at the end. So let's go ahead and start out with the people at home and for the people here in the audience. What is motion capture? What are we talking about? The, the work of building a motion capture system, it's, it's designed to take um, humans, animals, um, you know, basically bipeds and quadrupeds, and, and capture their, using markers to capture their skeletal structure, which then can then drive either an animated character or anything digital. Um, motion capture can even be used to uh, puppet an animated character. At, the, at its core, that's what you're actually doing. But um, it also allows you to basically track anything physical, anything in a physical space in a virtual environment. So now motion capture is bleeding into AR and VR projects as well. So people want to do motion, you know, uh, multiplayer gaming. And so you have a headset, you've got a gun, you've got eight of your friends, where computers on your back, and you can walk around a space, and the camera system that's there is tracking where all the players are, how they're interacting, feeding that data to the server so that you guys don't crash into each other. Um, it was started many, many, many years ago, and I think the, the pioneers of the industry were uh, Robert Zemeckis and James Cameron. You know, Robert Zemeckis spent years, you know, working on motion capture and trying to get it to a cinematographic, uh, cinematic? Cinematic. Cinematic, cinematic level. Cinematic. And then, um, then, you know, with Avatar, of course, James Cameron really kind of pushed it over the edge because they developed virtual camera systems which allow you to track a physical camera shooting a physical actor, but you're also tracking that camera's movements in the digital space so that um, when you want to comp it together in a shot with live footage and the digital footage, things appear where you want them to be cinem uh, cinematically. Okay. So um, virtual cam and simul cam are technologies that James Cameron really pushed in Avatar so that you can film a live actor and be able to see the digital character that's, that he's interacting with. Very yeah. cool. Awesome. Um, so we touched on this a little bit with you guys. What kind of um, careers translate well into motion capture? Like you said, you came from completely unrelated tech fields. You came from more or less voiceover and acting. Right. Uh, martial arts and dance is your background. So, so with that in mind, what kind of careers would you say um, would, would translate well, not just for motion capture, but for game development. If people are at home and are like, I've always wanted to work in video games, but like, I don't have a game background. Like, there's stuff that's applicable, and you can right. easily, like, you guys, both of you learned by doing. You didn't yeah. go to school. You didn't yeah. have tech backgrounds. Right. So let's talk about that. Um, I've, I've always done a lot of editing, and this is something I kind of recently rediscovered, and you'll get to, I don't know if you're going to play TJ's Reel later. It was but, on um, the promos. Oh, perfect. So the promos, cool. if you so, watched the promos yeah. and you saw TJ's Reel, that was edited yeah, by Yeah, so TJ. I edited that. So I, I, I dabbled here in editing, so I have a sense of software and just messing around and whatnot. Um, but for the most part, when it comes to tech side, I'm not, like, I'm not a super crazy hacker or coder, but it's just a matter of um, understanding, you know, just when it comes to gaming, right? So when you game, there's hotkeys, right? So you have hotkeys, you have your skills, you have your abilities, etc. 
same thing for the software. It kind of translates, not exactly in that sense, but it can, you can take that and apply it. That's why I was able to pick things up really quickly because I'm able to understand, okay, this is the UI, this is how uh, the software- What is UI for people that don't? Um, the user interface. So when you, when you play a game, it's like your health bar, it's like uh, the, the navigation, et cetera. So the UI on software systems, it's like this is where, um, this is where you'll go to calibrate or the option menu and whatnot. Something similar, just like Microsoft Word. But um, with that kind of concept and whatnot, I was able to pick up more on the software side, more of the tech stuff, and just through trial and error and, and mentorship and um, just having someone overseen be like, nope, you messed up, try this, or you know, this is where it goes, or this is how you do that correctly. In terms of the performance side, I, though I originally, um, I say VO, I had background in improv. Imp a lot of improv, a lot of theater. And obviously that's a lot of coming up with things on the spot and theater, you gotta be really big and you gotta, you gotta know how to use your body and um, mm. express certain emotions and whatnot. So that translated really well when it came to motion capture. But there is a difference because though you can take these mediums and bring it, which is really good if you have those things, it's, it's awesome. But understanding that motion capture or performance capture, um, which I'll get into right, right, right after, is a different medium. If you understand that, then it makes you that much more valuable. It makes you that much more um, easy to work with. Because in theater, you have the costumes, you have the stage, you mm -hmm. have blocking. So in motion capture and performance capture, you don't have anything. It's just your mind. And so you're, you're lucky gotta, if you have another actor. A lot of the yeah, time, you don't even have another actor. Exactly. Uh, there's, there's, there's so many examples of Richard. He's one of our mocap vault uh, gurus. He talks about, t and TJ too, where they had to play multiple characters. And you'll go and you get like punched in the face, right? And then they'll capture that. Then you gotta be the guy who throws the punch. So you gotta remember what you did. And it's just you. So there are things that are not the same. And you just, by understanding that, you get to, you get to perform better, you get to be a better tech, because as a tech, if you need something on the, on the technical side from the computer, there's so many times where it's like, oh man, if this actor just took five steps back, they would have, they would save <laughs> thousands of money. And it's not even a joke. It's, it's just take five steps back and reset yourself every single time. Well, and make sure that you pick up the same cup with the same hand. Exactly. You know? um, our, uh, like, let me just see a show of hands in the audience right now. How many of you are game developing or, or animation somehow? And then how many Wait. of you are directors, filmmakers who want to try and use mocap in your work? Yeah. Awesome! Wow. Okay. Cool. So we've yeah. got we've got a majority in games right now. Um, for you people in Twitch, I don't know if you saw that or not. Yeah. Uh, majority games, but we still have quite a few that are filmmakers that are interested in yeah. this tech, and it's it's it goes across both ways. You have, you wanted to add something? It definitely applies. Well, just really quick. So it definitely applies if you're a filmmaker. Don't think that's like video games are not a way to, to uh, things to dive into because a lot of the things translate mm -hmm. to film. Um, a lot of stuff that like me and TJ shot something and that was for a film and then there was a different day, it was, it was a video game, but same aspect, it's just understanding the medium and applying that. If they hire us, for instance, to do something, they expect us to understand the medium. No. You guys have spent a good amount of time watching superhero movies, I know you have, <laughs> and, and playing video games and feeding your imagination. And sometimes you're sitting there watching Superman versus Batman. You're like, man, if I was Superman, I would have done it like this. <laughs> <laughs> and that's important because that informs your performance. That oh. is going to be... And your, or, direction, and your direction. And your direction. And believe me, being a good director is not easy. Take that seriously. Learn how to communicate with your actors. Yeah. Because we work with a lot of people. Uh, Richard Dorton's in the back. He's one of the He keeps gurus trying to hide, but it's of, not he's successful. High, <laughs> but he's an incredible, he's one, of the, <laughs> he's one of the godfathers of motion capture. We started way, way back when there weren't directors in motion capture. There were creative directors. So they'd work. They knew coding. They knew everything about the video game. Then we got there, and they're like, OK, so you're the hero. <laughs> Action. I'm like, what am I doing? What am I doing? They didn't know how to talk to us about that. So communication as well as having a rich imagination is so important. So what you're doing, that time is not wasted. Play more video games. Try things you haven't done before. Like if you're a game developer, try actually 
seeing if you can jump into a motion capture suit. Try doing directing because the more aspects you learn, the easier it is. I've become a better motion capture actor by learning the tech side mm -hmm. because I realize, okay, if I don't get this in one or two takes, this is going to cost this much money. And all I need to do is move over over here and all of a sudden I can knock it out in one take or I know how to talk to the tech people so that I can say, okay, well, if you need me to do this, I can get you better data doing that. And that's because I filled up my toolbox with more than just being an actor or being a tech. It's learning all the aspects. So yes. Very cool. I want awesome. to yeah. dovetail off of that because the, the, most, the most important aspect of education that I got at USC's film school was, you know, semester one, I had to write, direct, produce, edit, sound design, five short films. Um, and that's just thrown right into the fire. I didn't know Avid, I didn't know Pro Tools, I didn't know um, Premiere. I hadn't, I'd, I'd never done my own editing. I'd always had somebody else edit while I directed them, okay, do this and do that. And so the, the more jobs that you learn how to do, like if you can go you know, be a soundie on your friend's short film, or if you can be an editor or a DIT, any, any position, once you do that, even if, even if you're not going to do it professionally, you're learning the language that allows you to speak to that individual on your production team in the language that they understand. Do as much as you can to learn other people's jobs so that everything down the pipeline is smoother. You know the pains that an editor goes through oh. when an actor has crappy continuity and you know, is picking things up uh, with the wrong hands or as a sound designer, you know what happens if you got that one actor who's eating the bowl of Doritos while somebody else is talking and all you're hearing is this like, really annoying crunch. So learn all of the positions because you're going to be building your own team, you know, yeah. and that's what you need to be able to drive. Cool. Yeah. And that's a huge um, aspect. On, Just, so go ahead. Oh, sorry. On, on the same kind of concept, which you were talking about of learning everything and, and, and um, you know, again, because this is geared more towards um, motion capture and game development, also film, um, how can people that are just starting out, like indie game developers or independent filmmakers who want to utilize motion capture, how can they, do they, they're not going to go run out and buy a, P, a perception neuron suit because they're not going to know how to run it. So how do they find people like you? Two places. Um, first, the mocap vaults. We've been speaking a lot about that. And second... The URL is yes. itsmocap.com. Yes. Just I-T-S mocap.com. One word. Yeah, it's great people there. They will teach you all kind of things. That's where I met all of these crazy guys. But also um, game conferences. You know, attend game conferences, you know, like GDC or E3 or Gamescom because you get to actually meet people who are working in the industry. So it's really about asking questions and going to where it's at. Go to a place where people are doing a lot of it and be a fly on the wall and then start asking proper questions so that you can learn more. Ari, right, did you have something to add? You know, you can also um, hang out in the public spaces at cinema schools, you know? There, you, you randomly run into students who are writing, directing, doing all their work, and if you're at the coffee bean, or if you're sitting outside you know, reading a book and somebody says, hey, can I sit at this table? And you can put yourself in places where random instances pop up where you meet somebody, and then you can say, oh, what project are you working on? What do you need help with? You know, and they'll, they'll always say, what do you do? And my response is, well, what do you need done? So let's go ahead and start moving into some of the more techy stuff, tech questions. Um, bless you. Bless you. Uh, I thought it would be really cool to start this segment off by taking a look at the different types of motion capture systems. Um, I have them kind of broken down, uh, and I have cool little examples um, that we can talk over, see if I can get... I am like the least tech inclined person, so I thought it was hilarious that I'm the one hosting this panel. What is that? Actually, TJ, hmm. uh, she was the playing first thing a game that I wanted earlier. to talk about is uh, the difference girl. between um, so, like just keyframe animation and uh, mocap animation, which is actually almost always, I would say, a blend of keyframing and motion capture. Okay, so we're going to look at some examples. This is all um, keyframed only, meaning that it. Uh, do you want to explain keyframing in animation? Uh, Keyframing key is basically um, a, uh, you know, somebody animated it um, with, by hand. I mean, that's... Your, Essentially, yeah, everything you're looking at. All this stuff is, you know, when the dragon's arms go up, somebody said, okay, you know, this is his stationary position, this is when his arms are up like that, and then mm -hmm. animate it. This is actually our esteemed guest, TJ. This is some of his work. 
eventually. I made this myself, so I apologize. <laughs> so if you guys, do, does anybody recognize this? It, it just dropped today, from what I understand, mm -hmm. right? And this is Halo Wars 2. Sick. TJ was Atriox. Sick. So the difference that you're seeing, obviously, this is hugely realistic, hugely lifelike in all of the movements because it is literally capturing on every joint of their bodies what they're doing in real, like, and you know, the data is then processed. This has keyframing in it though because otherwise it wouldn't be, you wouldn't have the, uh, the loading of the characters wouldn't show. Um, let's talk about that. Let's talk about uh, the difference between, or why do you use keyframing in some aspects versus, uh, versus like what are the restrictions of motion capture? Because there are still restrictions. Even though you're capturing all the data, that's not necessarily useful sometimes. You need to well, the, soften it up. The, what happens, especially in uh, cinematics, okay, is most of the time the uh, motion capture actor doesn't have like a physical environment to walk around in. They're imagining it, and so uh, sometimes you know they'll they'll have props. We try to we try to make it as as comfortable for the actors so that they they're able to do their job and we're able to capture the data. Um, but what happens when you go into the cinema, into filming the cinematic? Is you know there maybe the mocap hand is over here on the table when you need it here because you want it to fit, you know, perfectly in the frame. So animators modify you know both body and facial positioning um, for either physical movements or for a better emotional performance. When I was doing my research, it said something like uh, it cannot capture things that are not. Uh, in the realm of physics or something, or things that defy physics. And I'm like, well, of course not, because a human cannot defy physics in a volume. Why would you feel right. the need to put that on there, Wikipedia? Um, and he explained it's because of things like squash, uh, squash and stretch, which oh, is in right. keyframing, mm -hmm. um, things that humans, if it's a physical environment where the human goes through the floor or something like that, uh, that can't be captured in motion capture, so right. it would then have to be keyframed right. within, uh, within that kind of, the, the context of, of Again, making it more animated. Uh, I, I think of, it, it helped me to think of keyframing as kind of more cartoony, and then motion capture as more realistic in yeah. the in the movements of the characters. Would you guys, is that on the right, right. track? I I kind of think of it. It's like it helps. Motion capture will help capture the realism. Um, the reason you'll hear a performance capture uh, that was a right. term that was coined by uh, Tom Hanks when he did Polar Express, that uh, um, the Christmas movie, and. Uh, Performance capture because not only are we capturing movement or um, bodies moving any anymore, we're capturing facial expressions. We're, cap we're capturing acting. We're capturing full-on facial and body movements uh, from a VO aspect. If you're in a booth and you're just you're uh, you're screaming, you're angry, right? So even even people in a VO booth will move and. Uh, Express themselves in a certain way, and that needs to be captured because that is the that's the realism that we look for, that we relate to in video games. Um, there's certain exceptions with like you know Mario and Kirby and stuff. Well, that's because those are keyframed. Originally, yeah. yeah. But even then, now they're adding a little bit hints, you know, of you know, they're, they're studying. They're studying when you're going to keyframing as an animator, you're still studying right. real environments. So performance capture is capturing everything. So when we go back to motion capture, performance capture, and keyframing, we can we want the element, the real elements that we relate to, that we believe, and then the way I see it, uh, keyframing takes it to that next level, defying physics, like Superman shooting into the freaking sky, or if um, if it's like Destiny, that was one of the that things, um, you know, they'll Taking take King, yeah. they'll take the movements of like jumping into a pit, and then they'll take keyframing or you know it's, they'll go into it in post and make them fall you know hundreds of thousands of feet you're not going to do that in a real yeah. volume you know what i mean and it's, yeah that's just why yeah. <laughs> for animators one of the hardest things to do well is to walk to make the character walk and make it real is apparently extraordinarily hard because do you guys all know what the uncanny valley is by the way who, who doesn't know what Uncanny Valley is? Oh my gosh, look, we have so many Sweet. learned people. There's really like awesome. five hands. That's great. That's, That's awesome. Great. You guys rock. Ari's going to explain what that is in a second. Because <laughs> <laughs> he can do it better than I can. But you can, you're, you've watched people walk your entire life. So if you watch a cartoon character do it, Bugs Bunny, whoever, you notice they don't have any weight. So your brain says, oh, it's a cartoon. But if you want to make it more realistic, you use a motion capture actor. Now, that's the realism versus animation. 
there's also the uh, the money aspect. Yep. Oh yeah. This is How much one. does it? Well, I'm gonna let Ari talk about this, but it costs a lot more oh, and a lot longer to hand animate a thing happening, like a man running into a room, break down the door with an axe, and then pick somebody up and save them, than it does to simply put on a suit and do the same thing in real time. Yeah. So I'm gonna let Ari talk all about yeah. that. So the Uncanny Valley was coined by, um, uh, well, the effects industry, where the you're watching a digital character and your brain knows, okay, it's a completely digital character. Um, and there's a certain point of performance where it goes from being very cartoony, but they're trying to get closer and closer to lifelike actual humans, and the Uncanny Valley was the stopping point where if, the, if it's not crossed, then the audience is removed from the story because they're like, oh, this is fake. Um, the, the best examples, if you wanted to compare the two, is the differences between Beowulf, which was done by Zemeckis while he was developing performance capture systems, and then Avatar. Avatar, the reason why it blew up is because it's the first movie to have such so many uh, so emotional digital characters. Cool. Um, let us move on to the different types of systems, because this is my super favorite part, because I, I learned so much, and now you guys are going to. Um, so the first one, which is the one I think most everybody in the audience, if you're familiar at all with mocap, this is the one that you're most familiar with. It's called a passive system. It's the reflective system. It's what you guys do when you're markered up, and, and it uses um, infrared lighting to shine off of you know, little balls on your body and whatever. So this is this, uh, and we're going to talk about this with, uh, with our guests. It's going to queue up in a second because I'm really bad at making slides. We're just going to put that in there. OK, so this is Call of Duty. And um, so what they've got on them, if you guys want to talk about this a little bit, because it's using both faceware tech, right? Yep. Now we're moving into Beyond Two Souls. OK, so what, uh, what these are, this is a passive optical system. So um, there is, in the room that they're in, there is an array of cameras uh, set all over the place, high and low. And the space in, that the cameras are capturing, the amount of physical space, is called a mocap volume. And so the markers are placed strategically on the actors to build rigid bodies and skeletons. So. If you have a marker here on your forearm and here on your elbow, it knows that that's an arm, okay? But there's, each system has a very specific way to mark up the, the talent so that the software knows, okay, if I see these pattern, you know, these markers in this order, that's a skeleton. Mm -hmm. And then that skeleton is then solved by the software and it can drive an animated character. Cool. So that's your, that, I think, would you say that's the most common right now? Um, uh, yeah, optical is the most common because yeah. um, the, the, the titans in the field of, of optical tracking systems are OptiTrack and Vicon. And um, the, the reason why I think not only are they constantly updating and pushing their, their tech forward, but they also have really great help desk support so that when a movie studio, if something goes down, okay, you, you have a tech there who if they can't figure it out, they can call you know, either Vicon or OptiTrack and get somebody on there right away because you're burning tons of money during production. Cool. And yep. you don't have time for your stuff not to be working. Awesome. Yep. Um, the next one is uh, it's some of the newer tech. It's called an active system, which is an LED system. Uh, and it's used. this is it showing on Planet of the Apes. Um, there's a pretty long clip. Let me talk about this one. This is just the, um, the single emission. Um, okay. Yeah, where it's, it's steady, and they, they capped it like that because they were having issues with like, working in the Canadian rainforest, so they had to protect mm -hmm. the whole system. And it was the first one that was really more mobile. Right, and the, they still had an array of cameras. So what happens is you have you know, the director and DP figure out, okay, this is going to be the shot. Then everybody lights it and does all the stuff, and then you have to figure out how to get out there, get your cameras up and you know your your satellite cameras for capturing the motion capture, you know. So it's not being blocked by a tree, it's not being blocked by a light, um, you know, nothing's in the way, so that as the characters are moving, your cameras can see them and capture their data. And what happens frequently is you'll get everything set up, you know, your team will be like, aha, okay, now they're just putting you know last looks on it. And then the director will be like, you know what, actually, let's have him go down this path instead of that one. At which point you have to bust out there, tear everything down, the lighting gear all has to be moved over, and then you have to get it back up super fast. 
So we're all clear on that one so far-ish? Okay, cool. Uh, the next one, which is from my conversations with Demian, is not one of the more popular ones, and we're all going to get a good laugh out of this next clip, probably, um, especially because you were in the most recent Deadpool. Um, this is a semi-passive or a photosensitive marker system. This is used for outdoor shooting, <laughs> and God bless them, they try and do. Uh, so. Do you, you want to talk on this one, or do you want me to? Go for it. Uh, basically, this doesn't use any kind of reflective material. What it is is the camera actually tracks the difference between the... Um, that was a lovely little freeze frame. It... Back it up. It tracks the difference between the shades, right? So the black and the white. And that's, I guess, what the reference cameras tend to enjoy most. This is used out, uh, outside. I think this was also the tech that was used on Pirates of the Caribbean, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's a pain in the butt, and it doesn't look so great. If you can see, this is why he made fun of the animated suit in Deadpool. That, he has that dig in it, because it's obviously animated, right? Um, so it's because they map the whole body. You've got this netting, kind of the web all over him. And they have to go through, and someone has to hand animate everything on him, every yep. movement, every crease, every arm raise. It's not something you can just plug extra pixels in, like when you're doing a, a marker, uh, reflective, or an active suit. Uh, so this one is probably not one you would want to use. It's also not a cheap alternative, so they're probably going to start phasing this out. It was just more useful because you don't have a lot of breakable tech. It's very wearable. They used it in Pirates because they were filming up to their waist in the water most of the time. That's um, If you watch Pirates of the Caribbean, I think it was the second one. It's the one where they have all the dead sailors, and they all come back, and they're all zombie sailors. Uh, that's the tech that they used for that. So um, Cool. Uh, moving on. This is one. This is just going to be a quick one because it's kind of cool. Uh, and I have heard use of this. You guys can chime in as well. The next one is a markerless system that pretty much everyone in the audience will have access to in one way, shape, or form. And I've heard they are actually starting to make video games with it. It is the Kinect by Xbox, oh, right? That is a markerless motion capture system. You guys want to talk about that at all, about the uses for it in video game? Um, the Kinect is it's good because it's um, inexpensive. You, know, um, you can buy a couple of cameras, and then the software, you can, uh, they're starting to develop better software for it, for body recognition. But it does not get complex shapes. So, you know, if if I'm standing, you know, like this, and I'm doing this, it can clearly see all of my arms and legs. But if I start doing something where I'm crunched down like this, the software is like, what's that? I don't even know. <laughs> and so, um, sometimes. Um, are there um, any, like how there's the Vicon system and the Facewear system? Are there any mass marketed? Markerless systems that are used wide scale for like like massive video games or film or no, any application. Not, not yeah, for, it's just for little for it's for little home stuff. Yeah, but no. it's still fun. It's still fun and it's something to be aware of. Something that you can play with if you're just trying to figure out coding in yeah. general. Um, the last one that we're going to talk about is going to take us back to Planet of the Apes, and it is face wear. Or it's the facial recognition software. Which one did they use for Weta? Or is this their own? This Weta is proprietary. Is its own. Yeah, yeah, they completely built everything from the ground up. This is just amazing. Talk about facewear tech, because I could talk about this all day. <laughs> so, um, facewear and technoprops. Basically, I, I would. This isn't always, but I would. I'd break it down where facewear um, works on all of, like the AAA video game titles, and technoprops. Their helmet. Their helmet cams are pretty much on all of the AAA movies, um, and then you know. But Weta, Weta is you know their their own monster. Um, so what it's doing is you basically put a helmet on the actor with a camera right here and record their face. That's streamed off to a set of computers that the software is then able to analyze your facial uh, expressions, figure out, okay, these are the eyebrows, these are the nose, this is the mouth, this is where the chin and sides of the face are, and then um, that movement can be transposed onto a animated creature or animated person, whatever, yeah. whatever it is you're right. driving. I just want right. to point out how detailed it is. So when these actors are, are working towards the motion capture and they are becoming apes, right, um, there are certain mm, uh, physicalities that apes inhabit. And we're going to talk about physicality and acting and everything for this later on. Um, but this tech is so sensitive that in the next clip, watch his cheeks. Because in apes, they <laughs> at each other, right, to show irritation or to show misunderstandings. Um, this is so trippy to me that you can actually see him 
the actor's cheeks puff out and then the, the little ape's cheeks puff out. That's crazy to me. Do you know what a tiny movement that is? So the technology that Weta is coming out with and the precision of it is just, it's mind blowing. And I think it's so cool where, where it's gonna go with it. So uh, you guys have all used face mounted. What is that experience like? Because it looks <laughs> super awkward. <laughs> it's fun. Go to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so they, I'll just tell you what the experience is like. They put a, like a baseball hat on your head, and then they tighten it because the camera cannot move, not even a little bit. So it's got to be a fastened to your head really, really hard. And you have this mandible, sometimes one, sometimes two cameras, depending on the system in front of your face, which means if you're going to talk, what I'm doing right now, I could not do because I would hit the camera arms and they would mess up the data. So I have to do everything down here and if I want to take a bite of something or a drink of something, I have to mime it and then go back down. But the worst part is if you're doing a video game, uh, you're doing this all day long. And this thing is squeezed onto your head as tight as you can get it and then they go a little bit tighter just in case. Because we do a lot of action. So we're running, we're jumping, we're chopping, we're swinging, we're flipping and it's got to stay on and it can't move. So they're like, Oh, oh, you're going to run in the scene? Let's just tighten that up a little bit. And chin then, strap. Chin, chin strap. strap. So, but, uh, chin, chin strap. Oh, God, chin strap. Chin strap is like punishment for us. It's like we've been bad. Because the thing starts to jump a little bit, so they put a little chin strap on you. And then you look like a complete monster dork. And it, it's, but it is an experience. And it's painful, but pain is temporary. Video games are forever. <laughs> so so it's, it's, it's freaking awesome to see the amazing, like she said, the performance, the, the intricate movements that you get out of a face, out of a, just the simple eyes. And they also put you know, motion sensors on our fingers a lot of the time, too, because they want that. If they have a lot of money and they really want to clean all that up, then they do all of it. And it looks absolutely amazing. And I think it's worth it. Cool. Absolutely. Um, sure. Just piggybacking off what he said, what it does from an acting standpoint, it does change your performance. Um, I just recently did a mocap shoot to where I had to do a lot of waving in my face and I had to move in for a kiss. And it's weird trying to kiss when you have two people with cameras this far out because you have to make weird faces and you're doing one of these and stuff with a camera. <laughs> then you see yourself on the screen like I'm like an idiot. But it's interesting because what it does is you have to think both technically and performance-like because you don't want to break this thing because it's not cheap. But at the same time, you have to get a realistic performance. So it is very interesting having something like that on your head. And I know TK can even talk more yeah. about you know, learning how to reroute your performance. That's a big thing, yeah. especially for directors and actors that want to get into mo motion capture. You have to modify a lot of your performance when you're yeah. in these suits and have these things on your head because you can't do certain things. And um, yeah, some weird things will happen. You know, They say, oh, look down while you're walking down the stairs, and then you do one of these, a camera hits you in the stomach and now you have to do the whole takeover. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's one of the things of uh, performance capture is that you don't have to be within close proximity to each other. Yeah. So as traditional film and whatnot, you know, you want to see the stunt. You want to see someone get punched in the face. You want to see them grapple and get thrown. You can do that, but you don't have to. That's, that's, the, that's the, 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 one of the awesome things. You don't have to always get hurt. Um, like uh, Jarrell did a scene where he was in a helicopter and there was an incoming missile. And one of the moves was that he had to yell incoming and then dive and roll. He had that face camera on him. And it's if, right Yeah, here. and it's, imagine, you know those like, those, those huge braces that are like in front of your face? Imagine that except with like a little like GoPro or like a camera and then all this other gear going on. So imagine having that with like a pack and all this other wiring. So you have to adjust for that. And it's an LED light shining in your a face. Bright well. light. Yeah. So, Typically, you could just you know roll, and you know if your face wants to hit the floor, that's fine. But if you have one of these on, you can't do that. You gotta you gotta you gotta move your body. You gotta protect the thing. You don't want to damage the equipment because. Before we move on, let's start getting the suits on so we can be talking mm -hmm. as we're suiting up. What is the process for uh, for for game development, pre volume and post volume? So before you even get to the volume, what have you done with the game? And then after you've collected all your data, what happens to it after? Is that for me? For whoever wants to answer it. Takers, takers, Bueller. Well, um, let's see. Before, before the day of capture, 
It helps generally to have the world built and the assets built. Um, sometimes you have that luxury of being able to see the digital world so that you can inform the director as far as you know, movements, you can inform the actor as to the world that they're in, you know, living in. Um, but there's some games where you know, they capture the data and then they work on everything else and they'll, and they'll do it in segments. So they'll, they'll do like two weeks of capture on a game, pause, go run that into the game engine and then say, hmm, how do we want to tweak the story? And then a couple months later, come back and do another, you know, uh, another couple of weeks of mocap and then go back and say, hmm, okay, what do we want to build into the game now? So, yeah, I guess the, the more that you have available to inform your performance, the better. What's the next stop on the pipeline after you've just finished your last day in the volume, all of your data is captured? Um, you got to clean it. You know, so anything, anytime that an actor goes to the ground and the markers are occluded, that's missing data. So missing data um, causes broken performances. So you have to have mocap cleanup engineers go in there and actually fill in all of the all of the spots where the cameras couldn't see. Now, is that something that that just like when people raise their hand and they say, "Oh, I'm an animator," is that something that any animator can do, or you have to specially like know how to work with mocap data? They prefer animators that know how to clean mocap data because that makes you a double-edged sword. You can just take the cap; they can just give you the the, the Vicon or OptiTrack capture data, and then you can go to work on it because you know not only where. Cool. Okay. So um, next up, this is one for you as well. So feel free to jump in. Um, how important are visual references for uh, game designers, the people who are pulling the tech, and for the actors? Because I know that um, we have discussed in the vaults, and you yeah. also, I mean, looking at Atriox, right. he has mobility issues. Like there are things that you can't do um, uh, that you personally can. So. How important is it to have that visual reference? The motion capture world, especially when it comes to video games, especially video games and a lot of films, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but almost everything nowadays is super top secret. So I'm working on some stuff for Marvel. I'm working on stuff for DC. I'm working on some really awesome stuff, and I can't tell you about it because that's just the way the, the game is now. And they're, they're, they're movies, they're video games. There's more fun stuff coming down the pike, and I can never talk about any of it. Worse, I don't get to know what it is before I get to the, the studio that day. They've hired me a month or two months before, and then I'll still have no clue what it is that I'm working on. So if it were something like this, which, uh, for instance, uh, Planet of the Apes, that's something you'd want to study before you got there if you could. I would love to know that I'm going to be an ape for the next six months so I could study their particular movement. But in a lot of cases, we never get to know, and that's one of the the issues that we're dealing with with SAG right now uh, mm -hmm. so that we can hopefully find out a little bit. We'll get into that stuff later, but, but we oftentimes don't know. So we'll get to the okay. set and yep. we'll, we'll, they'll say, okay, you're a 10 foot tall alien today right. called Decimus or Atriox or, or whatever it is. And Do they give you the real names? They, most of the time they, they don't. Yeah. Some, sometimes they don't and they don't even tell us what game it is. So that makes the difference between, you know, it might be a Mario world, or it might be Halo 2, and there are different kinds of performances for that, so we don't always know exactly what it is that we're getting into until they finally say, okay, here's what we're doing. This is this, and they, they always talk in a whisper, okay, this is what we're doing today. It's really cool, but don't tell anybody. And I'm like, oh, well, awesome. So we try to make the performance as good as we can with what little information that we have, but uh, hopefully that'll change in the future. We can know a little bit in the future and they'll trust us to not talk about it in public, you know, blah, blah, blah. But we try to get as much prep as we can ahead of time. Um, some things you, you want to gain special skills for. Some characters need to be able to swing. Some characters need to be able to free run. Some characters need to be able to roll or to have a specific dialect or accent or something like that. So it's nice to have the prep time to get ready to do all that stuff. But we don't always get it. Um, we just do the best we can when we get there a lot of the time and, and build it out of there. Um, okay, cool. So, so for, I guess this one's more for Ari then because it's a little bit more techie. What are the limitations of the different systems? Like as far mm -hmm. as uh, we talked about um, some of them being more mobile than others, like you can take the LED systems, the active marker systems out of a volume. Um, you can use them out in a regular s scenario for a film. 
uh, so what are some of the limitations uh, among, like, the inertial system? So we're putting on something called an inertial system. <laughs> the, one of the limitations to this particular suit, the, lower your yeah, yeah. Don't um, talk this particular that. suit is, first of all, that. You can't really be around magnets. Um, a lot of metal, metal and different things like that. So I'm kind of doing one of these right here. Well, another limitation is um, another friend of mine. Her name is Alex. She's an amazing mo <laughs> motion capture actor. We actually call each other twins because we share okay. things and brains. But um, on a project that we were working on that's actually going to be at um, Tribeca Film Festival, we were doing a lot of action. And we were doing, we, were, we played probably, what, 10 different characters, Ari? We played a bunch of different characters, and we were running, jumping, falling on pads, and almost none of that was picked up because these suits can't pick up certain action moves. Like, you can't really go to the ground and can't do a lot of physical things that we were doing. I, I would actually... Yeah. I don't like... The, saying that they're limitations, yeah. okay? Depending on what you're creating is, depending on what the movement is and what the budget for the project is, will determine what kind of system you want to use. The benefits of a system like this that I'm putting on is that it is very, very cost effective. What's the you cost on a, on, a, on a perception neuron system? About 2000 to $2,500. And just for reference, what's the cost on a Vicon system? <laughs> about $100,000. <laughs> uh, and that's entry level. Yeah. So, um, and it's the amount of people and right. tech. Okay, like I can run four of these suits with two people. Yep. Look straight ahead. And you can do it almost Go ahead and anywhere. Put that, pin that um, on your forehead. Yeah, oh, sorry. And another cool thing about these suits on the benefit side is you can do mocap almost anywhere. We've seen people do it in classrooms, outside, in basements, um, random places, because if you have a strong internet connection and a couple of these suits and someone to run it, you can also do it in various places. So if you have a project that requires motion capture where the movements aren't too extreme, you get yourself one or two of these suits and you can pretty much do it there. You don't have to rent out an entire space to do it. You know, and that's another benefit. So the first thing that we have to do with the perception neuron system, once it's up and running and we can see that all the sensors are feeding me data, um, we have to calibrate the actors so that it knows the skeleton that it's being attached to. So are, are you familiar with all the poses? Uh, no, let this guy go first. Okay, so we're just going to do Jarrell. Well, I thought you mm -hmm. can do both at once, or you can? I can. You can. Oh, you can. Yeah, yeah, just copy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now this little dance they're about to do, and it's called a, is it a ROM? Is you're doing a ROM? Dance? No. It's calibration. You're not doing no, it? It's it's calibration? This is, yeah. We do some version of this called a ROM, yeah. which the computer just needs to know where your arms and your legs are. He'll explain it better than I can. Well, ROM, ROM is, it stands for range of motion. So for optical systems, you know, if you have a performer who's a dancer and they're able to move their body into like crazy situations that um, the, normal skeletal, the normal skeletal solver wouldn't recognize, you know, then what you do is a full range of motion with all of your limbs so that it knows, oh, okay, that person's capable of doing this. I can solve for that. I'm not going to give you an error when, you know, they fold themselves in half. Um, but for these guys, what we're going to do, we're going to do an A pose, a T pose, and an S pose. So A pose is feet uh, shoulder width apart, looking straight forward, and um, pop your elbows like this. Awesome. So it's, they're yeah. very straight and pointed down. Down by your side. Then from there, we're going to go into a T pose, which is wow. simply lifting your arms. I like making sounds. Okay. <laughs> Bam, there it is. And then an S pose is hands out in front of you and a, li a light squat. And the most important thing, right, the most important thing is that your feet, your feet cannot move during this process. So you can't step to the side, you can't. keep them shoulder width even to the S pose. Correct. Got it. Yeah, and you might want to bring them a little bit closer together. Bingo. So here we go. So give me an, oh, un momento. All right. So A pose and hold. Now, T-pose, hold, and S-pose. Okay, relax. I felt like we were synchronized. It was really cool. Okay, do me a favor. Yeah. Put that piece of paper <laughs> right in the center of the room. This? Yeah. Take it, just put it in the center of the room. Of them? Yeah. Just okay. drop it. So? Stand up, stand up. Just... Okay, one more thing that I want to do. Okay, 
the suits don't know where each other are in space. That's why they're both overlapping on top of each other right now. OK, face the audience and put, put that little floor marker right in between your feet. OK, give me a, give me a solid A pose. OK, go ahead and move off the dot. Gina, go ahead and take his place. OK, now try moving around. Oh, look, magic. Hello. Oh. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Um, so we had some um, audience, audience suggestions. Uh, yeah. Is there anything that you can do performance-wise to prevent Uncanny Valley? You want to do the research. You want to be as prepared as you can as a performer to do whatever part that they're calling you for. And they'll often use an entire team to get one special character down. Like for Colossus, it was five different people. I did the acting. There was a team uh, of incredible guys, the Action Factory, who did uh, the, the, the fight. So when you're watching Gina Carano fight with Colossus, that's the Action Factory. It's a guy named Philip Silvera. He did the action in Daredevil. Uh, those guys are absolutely amazing at making action happen. So it was his team, Philip Silvera's team in the Action Factory, that put that together. There is a guy who did the face, and the face technology also came from a different place. I believe, I'm not going to guess because I'm not sure exactly. But, and then there was a really tall guy. I think his name is Andre. Uh, I want to say he's a Russian guy. If you yeah. see pictures, you see him standing on the, the freeway with uh, Ryan uh, doing some of the scenes because he was the visual reference for what they were looking at. Because when I do the scene, I have to look at him and go, oh, you are standing here. You should come with me. But... I'm looking at his stomach because Colossus is seven feet tall, yeah. whereas the guy who was actually standing on the bridge was actually seven feet tall. So Ryan and the rest of the actors are like, dude. And it was great. It works out well. So it takes an entire team to bring a character to life a lot of the time. Uh, a lot of us will have a skill set that the others don't have. One's a good actor. One's a great free runner. One is a skydiver. Whatever it takes, they can do it. So uh, uh, lighting-wise, how would this uh, lighting for motion capture be different from a, a regular set lighting? Sounds cool. Really? Take this one? May I? Oh, part of it is, are you mainly film or anime? What are you lighting for? So, uh, no, regular set. Just regular. So that plays a part because the cool thing is that you know, you're practical. You, you know you got to set this up here you know, with the stands and whatnot. But with the digital realm, you can take a light and it just floats in free space. So you do have to understand great lighting, how you want to light it, et cetera, because that'll translate over. You have to understand that. It's just then becomes a matter of understanding the technology, the software, yeah. which isn't too much of a, exactly what they said. You're already halfway there. Now you just got to translate that over to motion capture, the digital realm, especially now with a lot of VR and AR coming out. That's going to be a huge aspect. And that's a whole other thing for lighting because you have a 360 thing. You got to understand how to light for 360. My question was, um, when you guys do the motion capture, do you guys stick to one rig, or do you use multiple different rigs to capture? It depends on the job. Um, all the data can interact with each other. The, no. It comes down to cost and time efficiency, as well as what the motion is that you're capturing. Um, is this just one person standing in a, in a, a subway, you know, waiting for a train to come? Ultra cheap, one suit, no problem. Is this a you know, choreographed fight scene between the hero and six ninjas? Optical, because right. you want to know where every single character exists in space and time. Right. So. OK, so you mentioned that after you record the, all the acting, it has to be cleaned up before it goes to Motion Builder. So I learned how to do that uh, in Cortex. Is that the software that you guys use, or there are other ones? Um, I, haven't, I haven't used Cortex. The, I usually use either uh, Vicon's Blade system or the OptiTrack system. I mean, the, the software that you're capturing with, you can also clean in. But um, the, the data can also be just exported and then taken to another, uh, another piece of software like Cortex, which would clean it. Yeah. it. It really depends on what your tech knows, you know? It's like, are you going to design something in Photoshop or Illustrator? Yeah. You know, what's the purpose and which, which program do you know? Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Um, okay, so we're going to start wrapping it up. I wanted to just personally thank all of you guys for coming in. This was amazing. Uh